Welcome once again to another episode of Strange Planet. Thanks as always for sticking me in your ear. And if you'd like to get deeper into Strange Planet, you might want to think about a premium subscription. Just click on the link in the episode notes. It's strangeplanet.supportingcast.fm, strangeplanet.supportingcast.fm. You get uh, commercial-free listening, access to bonus episodes, and a subscription to my monthly newsletter, Inner Sanctum, strangeplanet.supportingcast.fm. So we're going to talk about a, a groundbreaking paranormal documentary. It's called A Flash of Beauty, and it delves into the world of Bigfoot, the legendary and enigmatic creature that has captivated the imagination of people worldwide. And this film takes a unique approach by exploring the paranormal aspects that go beyond the flesh and blood theory often associated with Bigfoot sightings, and it blends eyewitness accounts, expert interviews, and compelling evidence to shed light a new light on this enduring mystery. Tobe Johnson is uh, the author of the Owl Moon Lab books and a researcher of all things related to Bigfoot. With over a decade of research and his own experience, he's dedicated his work to investigating the relationship of Sasquatch and the paranormal. Tobe is the co-producer of the documentary Flash of Beauty, Bigfoot Revealed. It's a groundbreaking two-part documentary series that focuses on Sasquatch witness testimony. Tobe has come to the conclusion that Sasquatch is not only very real, but is far beyond what most of uh, most would have you believe. Tobe Johnson, welcome to Strange Planet. How are you? Hello, Richard. Thanks for having us. My pleasure. Brett, is it Eckenberger? I should have uh, I should have asked you before we started. Brett, is it Eichenberger? Eichenberger. Okay, Brett yeah. Eichenberger. Thank you is an award-winning filmmaker with over 25 years of experience working in the film and video uh, production industry. His work includes the feature films Light of Mine and Pretty Broken, commercial short films, music videos, and documentary shorts. And filmmaking has taken Brett around the world, but he feels most at home in the outdoors of the Pacific Northwest, or as a friend of mine calls it, the Pacific North Weird. As a native Oregonian, Brett's been intrigued by Bigfoot since his childhood years, and this documentary has given him the opportunity to explore the topic in depth. Brett, welcome to Strange Planet. How are you? I am great, Richard. Thanks for having me. Um, what is both of your backgrounds with, with Sasquatch? I know you've been fascinated, Brett, since uh, you were very young. Uh, uh, Tobe, what about, well, we'll come back to you, Brett, but because I know a little bit, you know, you've been interested since you were young in Bigfoot. But what about for you, Tobe? When did it begin? Well, it was always just a nagging thought. You know, it was always on the periphery living in the Pacific Northwest. You can't really get away from it. It's what you're going to do with it. Are you going to ignore it? Are you going to pursue it? And um, my son and I happened to find a, a single track, uh, you know, a barefoot, naked, human-looking track, circa 2005 time frame near the town of Springfield, Oregon. And so that just kind of pursued father and son interest. And that's how the, the whole thing began, was really just on an innocent hike, finding a single footprint in the icy mud near, near Springfield, Oregon. And uh, Brett, how about for you? You know, uh, like, like I said, or like you said earlier, I've been interested in Bigfoot ever since I was a little, little kid. I, I don't remember when I wasn't interested in Bigfoot. And growing up here in the Pacific North, weird, I'm going to use that, by the way, um, you know, you can't avoid it. You can't avoid it. And even though I live in a, in a huge metropolitan area, Portland, Oregon, we're surrounded by forests and I've already done the research and we've had Bigfoot sightings within five to 10 miles from where we live in the suburbs. And so we're surrounded by them. And, you know, I've just always been interested in the paranormal. And so, you know, anytime I go out into the wilderness, I'm kind of, you know, I'm kind of looking around for Bigfoot. And so when the opportunity came during the pandemic to finally do a documentary about Bigfoot, both Jill, the co-producer, um, or the producer, I should say, Tobes, the co-producer, and I decided to go on a Bigfoot adventure, and we had no idea where it would take us. So talk about, there's uh, part one, which is uh, Flash of Beauty, Bigfoot Revealed, and part two, Flash of Beauty, Paranormal Bigfoot. Uh, how, do they, how do they differ? So what we quickly realized in the first month or so of the production of um, 
Bigfoot revealed was that there was too much paranormal for us to squeeze all of this into one film. Um, I should say just too much content in general. I mean, there are so many incredible stories and it would take us years to, to, to tell them all properly. So what we realized was we were going to have to take um, the content and split it up kind of not unlike the way that some of the Bigfoot community split up between the flesh and blood and the quote unquote woo. And so um, we, we got the first film finished. We put it out there. In fact, we were criticized because we didn't talk about the paranormal. Um, you know, I've read some, some critiques where people are saying, well, wait a minute, there's a whole other side. And we're addressing that side now. We wanted to give it its own movie, its own attention, because the fact of the matter is, is the data doesn't lie. The, these people that are experiencing these things are as honest and earnest and as ordinary as you could imagine. And so we wanted to give it the proper treatment. Is there a, I always hesitate lumping people together and calling them a community. Mm -hmm. Um, but in the Bigfoot community, I did it. Uh, <laughs> is there the kind of divide, schism, let's say, between those who, who believe this is just a flesh and blood creature, it's um, a, a remnant from you know some other era uh, that still exists in small pockets, a schism between that camp, let's say, and the those that ascribe paranormal attributes to this creature? I mean, and is it similar, let's say, to, I don't know, in the, in the UFO community, you've got two camps. UFOs are, uh, you know, ET is is uh, bad and ET is, you know, are, are whites in shining armor. Do you want that one, Brett? Go for it. Go for it. <laughs> yeah, there is. Uh, there's a There's a divide. I think that the divide is closing in on itself, just given the data that we have with the UFO evidence coming forward, because there is so much cross-contamination between uh, UFO witnesses and, and Bigfoot witnesses, and it really can't be ignored for much longer. So um, like we were saying a couple of weeks ago that, you know, most of these conferences, uh, we just got back from one in Vernal, Utah, Phenomicon, and there's a fair amount of um, Bigfoot enthusiasts, witnesses, researchers there, along with the evidence from Skinwalker Ranch. And I think that's for a reason. Um, I think, you know, the evidence is all, whether or not the world of the flesh and blood, the apers, as we lovingly call them, people that believe this is a relic hominid, um, and that's about it. This, this gap is closing. Wouldn't you agree, Brett? Yeah, I think, I think it is closing, especially you know, I first found out about this divide back in 2012 when we really started getting into uh, the world of Bigfoot, just just kind of as fans um, and just wanting to know more. I had no idea that there was even a woo side of it. And when I found out about, you know, th these tracks that would just stop in the snow and they weren't wouldn't turn around, they would disappear, the orbs, the lights and all this other kind of thing. Um, I was very, very skeptical because it just doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that if, you know, if you're an experienced Bigfooter and you've had multiple interactions with them, you at some point or another have had a paranormal experience with them, whether it's mind speak or it's orbs or missing time or any number of things that also coincidentally involve UFOs and abductions. So you just kind of hit on a bunch of different paranormal phenomena that's linked to Sasquatch, um, disappearing footprints as if there's some, I don't know, hyper dimension involved here. Uh, you mentioned orbs, you mentioned UFOs, you mentioned mind speak or telepathy. Um, I've heard the term psychic Sasquatch. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe just share some some case studies where some of these paranormal attributes uh, came to the fore. Well, we have a story in the Paranormal Bigfoot about a man named Rick Taylor. And Rick Taylor um, had had a sighting with his son one evening in Texas, not far from Dallas, I believe. And he and his son were night fishing, uh, which I'd never heard of. I didn't know you could fish at night, but they were night fishing and they had an encounter. And just like anybody else that's had a Bigfoot encounter, you kind of become addicted. You know, you want to you want to see it again or you want to experience it again or you want to learn more. There's really no go, going back from that. 
And so um, Richard found out about a woman named Arla who lived north of him in Oklahoma. And he contacted her and he says, I'd like to come up to your property. I understand that you have, you've had interactions with Bigfoot for over 50 years. I want to see if I can see one, if I can experience one. And so he got up there and, um, you know, I don't want to give anything away, but he had a mind speak experience, which was totally new to him. He'd never had something like that happen to him before. And the mind speak experience that he had, um, and when I first heard the story, I got chills because it's, I'll just leave it at this. It's deep. It's, it's, it's very deep on so many different levels. Um, talk to me about the, the relationship between Sasquatch and uh, orbs. Uh, I don't know, just give me maybe an example of how people see uh, Bigfoot and, and, and how orbs enter into this. There's, uh, you know, and I know Tobe can, can kind of extrapolate on this too. Um, there seems to be some sort of relationship between the two. In other words, people will see orbs at about the same time they see Sasquatch or Bigfoot. Um, you know, there's, there's uh, the, the famous um, Sierra Sounds, um, Ron Moorhead and the Sierra Sounds. They saw orbs up there. Um, not often, but they would see them. Um, and we have another woman in our film, Ashley Stinnett, who has had many, many orb sightings, hundreds of orb sightings. Um, and some of those have correlated to Bigfoot. Some of them have not. Some of them have been um, captured on video, which we, we show in our film. So there, there, there seems to be some sort of relationship. There's all kinds of different theories as to what they are, you know, whether they're the spirits of Bigfoot, whether they're Bigfoot entering this realm. Um, and again, I, you know, Tobe can kind of extrapolate on that a little bit more. <clears throat> well, you know, if Simeon Hine was here, he'd have a, you know, a, a much more intelligent, cogent, <clears throat> scholar, scholarly answer than we do. Uh, he's in our documentary talking about something called relic neutrinos, which are basically the building parts of all of us that still exist from the Big Bang and can go from basically... Uh, they can change matter from light to physical beings. That's that's the theory anyway. And um, so he's kind of the anchor for this documentary as the rest of the witnesses, including myself, talk about these light anomalies. And early on, after this initial print was found from my son, I got to know that there were these two camps, these two communities, and this other community, the Ron Moorhead types, we're saying, you know, there is this other side, this attribute uh, to Sasquatch that is totally unexplainable. And you will eventually see UFOs in the proximity of probably, you know, Bigfoot habitat, Bigfoot hotspots. Um, and that gets into these place names, which we talk about, which are names all over the, you know, the globe. All, you find a map, it has a crazy name like Devil Mountain, you know, um, Wendigo Ridge, things like that. And these are you know, places where the veil is thin and these lights seem to appear more often than not. One of the first places I saw them was near a place called Skookum Creek. Uh, they presented themselves like, um, they look like a headlamp, maybe a hundred yards off as the sun went down. That's what we took them as. And then uh, that was preceded by close up encounters right over the tree line of different colors, uh, usually volleyball shape and size to softball shape and size very hard to explain they have their own self-contained light to them but you know here we are next to skookum skookum creek this is the old indian name for bigfoot and that night we had rocks thrown at us um, later on we would have a log thrown near our campsite um, so there th that was one of the you know initial steps you know, for me that personally said, this isn't a waste of my time to look at these other avenues be, being related. I also want to add to really quick that um, the, a lot of people out there that, that are familiar with the ghost community will, will know that there's a lot of orbs that are captured in haunted houses and stuff like that. And there, there, there is a difference between um, what we're talking about and sometimes what you'll, you might see in pictures. Uh, there's a lot of times, and, and this gets kind of technically you know, into the way that a camera functions, but there are a lot of times where you might get a raindrop or indoor dust particles or whatnot. And, and those will look like orbs, but they're not necessarily orbs. You can, they're, they're translucent. You can see through them. And that all has to do with the way that the, the flash fires and the way that the shutter works in the camera. So 
what we're talking about are actual physical glowing balls of light that people see with their eyes. It's not something they're picking up in a still frame or something like that. Mm -hmm. So I, I just want to be very specific on, on what we're talking about so people can really start forming an idea in their mind. Um, Dr. Simeon Hine talks about ball lightning. Mm -hmm. and, and there's some people out there that are familiar with ball lightning. It's the same. We think that it might be the same kind of um, mechanics and dynamics. Um. I, actually, I was that anticipated my my next question was was about um, ball lightning because I've I've spoken to Simeon a couple of times and you're right. I mean, he's just he 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 takes a real deep dive into this. It's it's absolutely fascinating, and I know people will enjoy him in in the film. Uh, is there a paranormal um, attribute that we we haven't talked about that people might be shocked, surprised to know that is somehow associated with Bigfoot? We haven't talked about cloaking yet. No. Um, and there's some people out there that might be a little surprised about cloaking. Um, you know, again, that's another example of a story that we have in our film. Um, you know, in a number of years ago, this, this particular video um, got quite a bit of views on YouTube. And, and basically, it's a cloaked Bigfoot that was taken by you know, Barb Shoup uh, in the middle of the day in near Mount Rainier, just outside of Mount Rainier National Park. And um, this video is very compelling. Um, you know, I was skeptical when I first saw it. I asked Barb if I could have the original footage from the camera. That's very important to me. I want to make sure it wasn't tampered with or hoaxed. And I went through it and I looked to debunk it. And, you know, that's what we need to do as researchers. So I went through it and I went through it and I went through it and I went through it. And I, you know, I kept checking boxes going, no, this is real. This is real. This is real. And finally, I got to the exhausted my list and the hairs literally went like this. And then I, it was then I, and they are right now, it was then that I had realized that I was looking at something absolutely extraordinary. Something that, that to me is on the same level, the Patterson Gimlin film in the realm of the paranormal. And I know that's a lofty comparison, but I really believe it to be true. And um, we, you see a, you clearly see a figure that is cloaked. It looks like Predator and it turns and it runs away. And we show it multiple times in the film, so, so, you know, it's not hard to miss. But we do show the original footage, and it's hard to see in the original footage. Mm -hmm. What's very interesting about that is that Barb Shoup, as she was recording the footage, saw a black figure turn and run. It cloaked on camera, but it didn't cloak in real life. Oh, interesting. Stunning. Stunning. And, I mean, you talk about advanced intelligence. There's a great example of it right now. So I took that footage, and I showed it to Eric Bard. The, the head scientist of Skinwalker Ranch TV show and of Skinwalker Ranch. And uh, he was at a loss of words. He didn't know what to say. Gentlemen, we'll take a quick time out, come back and uh, continue to delve into Paranormal Bigfoot. Stay with us. Hi there. If you want to watch the rest of these episodes, please head over to my Rumble channel, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. You can watch complete episodes there. New, complete Unedited episodes drop every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Again, the Rumble channel is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. In the meantime, I want to thank you for supporting this YouTube channel all of these years. However, the problem is I never know when I'm going to run afoul of the censors at YouTube. I never know when I'm going to end up in YouTube jail. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason. And in fact, two more strikes and this YouTube channel will be taken down altogether. So... Help me fight big tech censorship, enjoy the complete unedited episodes, and join the rest of the Strange Planet community over on Rumble. Again, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet on Rumble.com. See you over there. Welcome back. A Flash of Beauty, a groundbreaking paranormal documentary delving into the world of Bigfoot. And Brett Eichenberger and Tobe Johnson are here. Um, so Sasquatch, obviously not just an animal, 
uh, what have you been told or, or maybe experienced that clues you in on, on what they might actually be? That one's for you, Tob. Hmm. Well, you know, they are flesh and blood to a greater degree than, you know, um, a lot of people in the paranormal community are willing to talk about. There is this physicality to them. There is this latent DNA. There's, there is this trace evidence that you can find. There's footprints. There's hair. They're, they're more than spirit. They're more than these light forms. However, um, you know, what is that? What is the ability to go from something physical to this energetic, these variables between both worlds? You know, the Native Americans said that they do live in both worlds. That was one of the first clues I had that they were able to do that. And, um, you know, I think that they are an old land spirit of some kind, uh, you know, an ancient land spirit. That sounds pretty, you know, rabbit hole-ish. I get it. But there is this uh, there's unwavering story, this narrative here that they are totally connected to the land and you know, this uncomfortable idea that they somehow cloak. I think, you know, we can we can lean into the fact that people have seen I've interviewed people that have seen Sasquatch go into trees. Now, they don't mean behind trees and up the trees. No, they mean into the actual bark of the tree. I've talked to at least three people that have witnessed that. And it's preceded by these strange thump or knocking sounds, um, which lends us to believe, you know, is Bigfoot just a primate knocking on trees? I don't know, because this idea of knocking on wood is an old thing. I mean, we do it for good luck. Um, these are things that we need to start delving into and um, maybe looking into the mystery of like the green man. Interesting. The idea that they can cloak, that they, they seem to be able to um, move from one dimension into another, uh, doesn't bode well for ever getting any sort of, you know, that, that smoking gun piece of definitive proof, like a body, right? No, no. And that's a, that's a discussion that we have in our first film, you know, although we don't touch on the paranormal side of things, uh, we touch on the fact that, um, you know, let's just say that they are flesh and blood that die here on earth and their bodies left here on earth as opposed to the other dimension. Um, you know, there's a lot of reasons as to why it's difficult to find a body. Um, I think the, you know, there's a lot of people out there, a lot of researchers out there that believe that they bury their dead. And I've heard natives talk about that specifically about how they've actually found, you know, the, the areas, the cemeteries, the graveyards, whatever you want to call it. Um, <clears throat> but at the same time, yeah, I, I, I think that, um, you know, whatever their, mission is here on earth or what whatever you want to call it they uh their first priority is to stay secretive you know with with some exceptions to that rule and the, the exceptions to that rule i think pertain to certain people that are either at the right place or the right time or they're um they've got the mind to comprehend seeing something like that or and or the bigfoot can sense that this person is somebody that they can have a relationship with um, getting back to the, the, uh, UFO aspect, um, are, has a Sasquatch ever been seen, um, entering or exiting a UFO or interacting with extraterrestrials? Well, I know I've spoken to Linda Moulton Howe on one occasion. We had an email correspondence in, uh, the late, uh, 2010, I think it was. And um, I wanted her to come speak at a conference I was putting on. And she said, I'd be happy to talk about Bigfoot, you know, one of the other aliens, because they've been seen along with other abductees and craft as though they've been taking along for the ride. Um, I've spoken to people that are part of this APER community. They've told me, you know, after a couple of beers that, hey, you know, I have this trusted friend that was, you know, skiing on the back of Mount Hood. And they swear they saw Bigfoot, you know, being zapped up into a blue beam of light into a craft. Um, certainly Skinwalker Ranch talks about hairy humanoids coming out of orange orbs over the mesa, stepping out. Um, yeah, so there, there is this, uh, this nagging link be between the two. And I think this is where the research is heading. Uh, you know, I'm grateful to have Brett alongside me here looking down the strange path right now, because 
really, you know, you get a lot of arrows in your back in the beginning, you know, 2005, nobody was really looking into this uh, that much and that heavy, except maybe Ron Moorhead and a few others. But uh, for the most part, you know, it's the same evidence over and over again, the trackways, the hair, there, there's so much more out there. These, these, these entities, these beings that seem to have a language, they seem to have a culture, they seem to want to engage humanity. They seem to come to people's homes, even at great distances, much like a poltergeist or haunting or uh, an ET contact. Um, you mentioned the language, which brings us back to Ron Moorhead and the Sierra Sounds. How would you describe the Sierra Sounds to someone who hasn't heard the audio? They are, they, they've been coined, there was a term that was coined that was, they, they called them the Samurai Sounds. And it, it, it fits. I mean, um, they kind of sound like samurais arguing with each other, you know. Um, they, they definitely seem as if you were to cross a human talking really fast and a, an ape, an agitated ape, you know. Um, I've heard some people compare it to Asianic, other Asianic languages, such as Vietnamese. Um, but it's, a, it's definitely a very strange language. And I think... You know, I played it for a friend of mine who's she's very still very skeptical on Bigfoot, and she laughed when she first heard them. But when we listened to him over again, it was a total change when she started kind of um, digesting what these sounds were and how these sounds were being made. When you really listen to him closely, you start thinking to yourself, "These this is not something that has the lung capacity of a human to go so high and so low um, like this, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth." And, and um, is the Ron Moorhead recordings, the Sierra sounds, is, is that isolated or, or, or is that been kind of uh, corroborated with other recordings? Yeah, it has been corroborated. Um, you know, Scott Nelson is a Navy crypto linguist that has been working with Ron as, uh, you know, just an interested party that found Ron on the Internet. Uh, but he has the background as a crypto linguist to really take these parts uh, the, of these sounds apart and understand them as what is called morphine streams, which are basically meaning and tone and uh, without actually description of what they're saying, you get this human quality in there that is language. Um, you know, I, we've recorded sounds in, in our story at the Al Moon Lab that are very similar in tone, language, and these morphine streams. Um, and I think there's a reason for that. I think when, just like Ron had his activity, he was isolated in a place they were familiar with him. It was almost like his little second home. He was coming there quite a bit during a period of time. In fact, um, you know, before the 1950s, as uh, you were saying, Brett, uh, they were coming up to the Sierra camp. Now, our place in little town of Cottage Grove, Oregon, again, we were very interested in the subject matter. It was a secluded environment near a Bigfoot area. They were coming in and out of that area, interacting with us. And eventually, using audio equipment is totally different than using camera equipment. Whatever is going on with the permission slip, we just don't have it with video. We seem to have it with audio. And so, yeah, there, there is cooperation beyond just us getting what I would call, you know, samurai chatter. But... Um, there's, there's other recordings out there as well. A guy named David Ellis, uh, who should have a book coming out soon about this, uh, talks at, at length about that. All right, uh, Tobe and Brett, we'll take another time out, come back and uh, delve further into Paranormal Bigfoot. Stay with us. Hi there. If you want to watch the rest of these episodes, please head over to my Rumble channel, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. You can watch complete episodes there. New, complete Unedited episodes drop every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Again, the Rumble channel is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. In the meantime, I want to thank you for supporting this YouTube channel all of these years. However, the problem is I never know when I'm going to run afoul of the censors at YouTube. I never know when I'm going to end up in YouTube jail. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason. And in fact, two more strikes and this YouTube channel will be taken down altogether. So... Help me fight big tech censorship, enjoy the complete unedited episodes, and join the rest of the Strange Planet community over on Rumble. Again, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet on Rumble.com. 
See you over there. Welcome back. A Flash of Beauty, a groundbreaking paranormal documentary delving into the world of Bigfoot. And Brett Eichenberger and Tobe Johnson are here. Um, so Sasquatch, obviously not just an animal. Uh, what have you been told or, or maybe experienced that clues you in on, on what they might actually be? That one's for you, Tobe. Hmm. Well... You know, they are flesh and blood to a greater degree than, you know, um, a lot of people in the paranormal community are willing to talk about. There is this physicality to them. There is this latent DNA. There's, there is this trace evidence that you can find. There's footprints. There's hair. They're, they're more than spirit. They're more than these light forms. However, um, you know, what is that? What is the ability to go from something physical to this energetic, these variables between both worlds? You know, the Native Americans said that they do live in both worlds. That was one of the first clues I had that they were able to do that. And, um, you know, I think that they are an old land spirit of some kind, uh, you know, an ancient land spirit. That sounds pretty, you know, rabbit hole-ish. I get it. But there is this uh, there's unwavering story, this narrative here that they are totally connected to the land and you know, this uncomfortable idea that they somehow cloak. I think, you know, we can we can lean into the fact that people have seen I've interviewed people that have seen Sasquatch go into trees. Now, they don't mean behind trees and up the trees. No, they mean into the actual bark of the tree. I've talked to at least three people that have witnessed that. And it's preceded by these strange thump or knocking sounds, um, which lends us to believe, you know, is Bigfoot just a primate knocking on trees? I don't know, because this idea of knocking on wood is an old thing. I mean, we do it for good luck. Um, these are things that we need to start delving into and um, maybe looking into the mystery of like the green man. Interesting. The idea that they can cloak, that they, they seem to be able to um, move from one dimension into another, uh, doesn't bode well for ever getting any sort of, you know, that, that smoking gun piece of definitive proof, like a body, right? No, no. And that's a, that's a discussion that we have in our first film, you know, although we don't touch on the paranormal side of things, uh, we touch on the fact that, um, you know, let's just say that they are flesh and blood that die here on earth and their bodies left here on earth as opposed to the other dimension. Um, you know, there's a lot of reasons as to why it's difficult to find a body. Um, I think the, you know, there's a lot of people out there, a lot of researchers out there that believe that they bury their dead. And I've heard natives talk about that specifically about how they've actually found, you know, the, the areas, the cemeteries, the graveyards, whatever you want to call it. Um, <clears throat> but at the same time, yeah, I, I, I think that, um, you know, whatever their, mission is here on earth or what whatever you want to call it they uh their first priority is to stay secretive you know with with some exceptions to that rule and the, the exceptions to that rule i think pertain to certain people that are either at the right place or the right time or they're um they've got the mind to comprehend seeing something like that or and or the bigfoot can sense that this person is somebody that they can have a relationship with um, getting back to the, the, uh, UFO aspect, um, are, has a Sasquatch ever been seen, um, entering or exiting a UFO or interacting with extraterrestrials? <clears throat> well, I know I've spoken to Linda Moulton Howe on one occasion. We had an email correspondence in, uh, the late, uh, 2010, I think it was. And um, I wanted her to come speak at a conference I was putting on. 
And she said, I'd be happy to talk about Bigfoot, you know, one of the other aliens, because they've been seen along with other abductees and craft as though they've been taking along for the ride. Um, I've spoken to people that are part of this APER community have told me, you know, after a couple of beers that, hey, you know, I have this trusted friend that was, you know, skiing on the back of Mount Hood, and they swear they saw Bigfoot, you know, being zapped up into a blue beam of light into a craft. Um, certainly Skinwalker Ranch talks about hairy humanoids coming out of orange orbs over the mesa stepping out um yeah so there there is this uh this nagging link be between the two and i think this is where the research is heading uh, you know i'm grateful to have brett alongside me here looking down the strange path right now because really you know you get a lot of arrows in your back in the beginning you know 2005 nobody was really looking into this uh that much and that heavy except maybe ron moorhead and a few others but uh, for the most part you know it's the same evidence over and over again the trackways the hair there, there's so much more out there these 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 entities these beings that seem to have a language they seem to have a culture they seem to want to engage humanity they seem to come to people's homes even at great distances much like a poltergeist or haunting or uh, in ET contact. Um, you mentioned the language, which brings us back to Ron Moorhead and the Sierra sounds. How would you describe the Sierra sounds to someone who hasn't heard the audio? They are, they, they've been coined. There was a term that was coined that was, they, they called them the samurai sounds and it, it, it fits. I mean, um, they kind of sound like samurais arguing with each other, you know, um, they, they definitely seem as if you were to cross a human talking really fast and a, an ape, an agitated ape, you know. Um, I've heard some people compare it to Asianic, other Asianic languages, such as Vietnamese. Um, but it's, a, it's definitely a very strange language. And I think, you know, I played it for a friend of mine who's she's very, still very skeptical on Bigfoot. And she laughed when she first heard them. But when we listened to him over again, it was a total change when she started kind of um, digesting what these sounds were and how these sounds were being made. When you really listen to him closely, you start thinking to yourself, these, this is not something that has the lung capacity of a human to go so high and so low um, like this, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And, and um, is the Ron Moorhead recordings, the Sierra sounds, is, is that – isolated or, or or is that been kind of uh corroborated with other recordings yeah it has been corroborated um you know scott nelson is a navy crypto linguist that has been working with ron as uh you know just an interested party that found ron on the internet and uh, but he has the background as a crypto linguist to really take these parts of the of these sounds apart and understand them as what is called morphine streams which are basically meaning and tone and uh without actually description of what they're saying you get this human quality in there that is language um you know i we've recorded sounds in in our story at the al moon lab that are very similar in tone language and these morphine streams um and I think there's a reason for that. I think when, just like Ron had his activity, he was isolated in a place. They were familiar with him. It was almost like his little second home. He was coming there quite a bit during a period of time. In fact, um, you know, before the 1950s, as uh, you were saying, Brett, uh, they were coming up to the Sierra camp. Now, our place in the little town of Cottage Grove, Oregon, again, we were very interested in the subject matter. It was a secluded environment near a Bigfoot area. They're coming in and out of that area, interacting with us. And eventually, using audio equipment is totally different than using camera equipment. Whatever is going on with the permission slip, we just don't have it with video. We seem to have it with audio. And so, yeah, there, there is cooperation beyond just us getting what I would call, you know, samurai chatter. But um there's, there's other recordings out there as well. A guy named David Ellis, uh, who should have a book coming out soon about this, uh, talks at, at length about that. All right, uh, Tobe and Brett, we'll take another time out, come back and uh, delve further into paranormal Bigfoot. Stay with us. Mm -hmm. 
as you're staring up at the night sky. Ever wonder who's staring back? You're listening to Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. And we are back with Brett Eichenberger and Tobe Johnson of Flash of Beauty, a two-part documentary series. How do we screen it, gentlemen? So uh, Flash of Beauty, Bigfoot Reveal is available now on Amazon. It's on Tubi. It's on Vudu. It's on Google Play. It's on YouTube um, uh, for rent on YouTube. Uh, it's on iTunes. It's all over the place. A Flash of Beauty, Paranormal Bigfoot will be available in all of those same places on October 17th. Uh, the trailer is online right now on YouTube. All right. What about for you two personally? Uh, I mean, it sounds like you've had some relatively close encounters. You've had rocks thrown at you, logs thrown in your direction, but um, is that the extent of it or have you had anything, I don't know, up close and personal? Yeah, it's a, it's an extensive story, but the quick and short of it is I talk about Sasquatch contactees and myself and a property owner by the name of Daryl Adams uh, had uh, ourselves in proximity to a Bigfoot location in a little town of Cottage Grove, Oregon. Brett, as well as Jill um, and the cameraman Mike, uh, were all invited to this this house to experience the strangeness, not only at the location, because eventually the house did sell, but this was one of those window areas where the phenomena started in the tree line. It started with Bigfoot whoops, knocks, and what I would call gifting. Um, where they bring gifts and you return gifts and there's this exchange program going on but also sightings but it ended someplace completely different than that it ended in you know the world of the poltergeist it ended in outer space looking up at two in the morning at strange chandelier lights you know uh, dropping little lights over the power lines into the trees and this was you know this was what was fascinating to me is that the, there was so much cross contamination with these other paranormal phenomena that it was it was very difficult not to say this was a place very you know reminiscent of uh, Skinwalker Ranch or any of these other ranches out there and so and I don't think it's just confined to you know places that are uh, set apart like this out in the middle of nowhere I think people have these window areas and these other little hot spots all over and that they they seem to ebb and flow based upon maybe who the individual is maybe what they have in their house that's unique to that location maybe the geology um so there's a yeah there's a lot to this story here and in, in the documentary we get close and personal with ufos connected to to sasquatch way beyond my story how about you brett so we've had a variety of interesting um situations i guess or experiences um we've seen ice shine um which you know that's a, that's actually another phenomenon that we haven't discussed and ice shine is that they they create their own kind of bioluminescent glow behind their eyes this is not a situation like a deer in headlights where eyes the lights reflecting back this is kind of like a bioluminescence and um we saw that in the midwest both myself jill and mike saw that um, and I have a photo of uh, uh, some snapshots that are in the documentary that kind of show the almond shape of an eye. For whatever reason, I only got one eye. I don't know if there was a branch. I just made a heart somehow. That was very unintentional. <laughs> um, but anyways, <laughs> their eyes kind of looked like those red hearts that were floating across the screen a second ago. Um, and I, so I put that in the film and you can see the almond shape. Um, we've had, we've heard extremely loud wood knocks. I was down in the Owl Moon Wilderness, which is featured in the film, and I was knocking on a tree, being kind of a jerk to the Bigfoot people in the area, and uh, wasn't getting any reaction, wasn't getting any reaction. I think I did it maybe 10 times. And then, you know, granted, we're out in the middle of nowhere. And all of a sudden, I got a response back, and it was loud, and it was direct. And it scared the heck out of me. And I knew it was kind of like, shut up. You know, we get it. <laughs> it was very to the point. Um, and it was unmistakably the sound of wood on wood. Um, and we've had, I mean, just for instance, last week we were doing an interview um, on our latest film about Ron Moorhead. Um, that'll be out sometime late next year. 
And we had a Pelican case that was wide open, that container camera equipment. And we were talking about communicating with Bigfoot and the case shut. It's just slammed shut. There was no wind. There was no nothing that would explain why something like that would happen. So we get, we get small little reminders of them kind of almost saying like, we're here or we're there or, or whatever. Um, and it, it happens virtually at every shoot. Um, what about the, um, the infamous odor associated with Sasquatch? Um, what, what do you think that's all about in, in light of all of these, you know, paranormal attributes? Does it have something to do with that or? You know, I don't know. One of the more interesting theories, um, we didn't shoot this in our documentary, is that uh, they have some kind of bioweapon that they utilize to protect their young. A gal by the name of Brenda Harris chronicled her place out on the Four Corners area, and she was having constant activity. There was an irrigation pipe that uh, was taken apart and spun 180 degrees. I think it was over like 30 feet long or something like that, and all the gaskets were ripped off of it, and blood trail was found on the white plastic. And inside this irrigation tube was uh, a mutilated skunk, and something had grabbed the skunk, been chasing after it in the irrigation pipe, and then squeezed it and went only after the scent gland. Um, I think that's pretty interesting to note that, um, you know, A, they're having Bigfoot activity, something spun this giant irrigation pipe, and then only went after one thing here. So I hate to sound like ancient aliens, but what if <laughs> they grab the, the old scent gland there and save that for some kind of protection device? Because witnesses will describe a, a skunk type of smell along with feces and death and all the other beautiful uh, odors. Um, what about... I mean, here's another, you know, schism, I suppose, in the the, the, the the Bigfoot cams. One that this creature is um, capable of being incredibly menacing, even threatening or aggressive. Uh, and others who think this is, um, you know, this passive, beautiful spirit that, you know, does not want to harm anything. Part of the reason we called our film A Flash of Beauty is because, uh, you know, Stan Avery, who's in the first film, talks about how you see them and then in a flash of beauty, they're gone. And we wanted to kind of dispel this myth that they're all monsters. There's been this kind of generalization that they're all monsters um, or they have some sort of aggressive behavior. And of course, Hollywood hasn't done us any favors with some of the movies that have come out. Um, you know, I. I tend to tell people that they're just like people, you know, um, there are good people and there are bad people. And I think there's good people and there's, I mean, there's good Bigfoot and there's bad Bigfoot. You know, there's some, there's definitely in the Northwest, there are some tribes that are kind of known as, or clans that are known as aggressive. You know, there's a clan near Mount St. Helens that's known as being aggressive. You know, I think that anytime that somebody sets foot into their territory, and they're trying to protect something or they don't want you to see them, they're going to do things to try and get rid of you, throwing rocks, making scary noises, um, whatever they can to be intimidating. But on the flip side of that, there are maybe potentially thousands, more than thousands of people in this country alone or in North America alone that have relationships with them that are, um, you know, gifting based, that have a humanity to them that I think a lot of people wouldn't believe. Some of the humanity that goes in, in the gifting, some of the personalization that goes through the gifting, you know, and that's something more that Tobe and, you know, Daryl have experienced and Tobe can, can kind of extrapolate on that. But they're, they're, they're certainly, and they're certainly curious and they have a sense of humor as well. And, and being that they have a sense of humor shows a great deal of intelligence. What is the appropriate gift for a Sasquatch? I mean, what, talk, talk to me some more about this gifting. What, is, what, what kind of gifts are exchanged? You can get away with a lot with Sasquatch. Um, you, can, you don't have to spend the big dollars. You can end up at the Dollar General. They're, they're plenty happy with a, a jar of peanut butter, it turns out, which is a buck 25 in Oregon. But um, one thing, I mean, I can tell you what they're not fans of based upon what happened to us in Oregon, what they are fans of, usually shiny things stones um seem to be a big one 
Um, they seem to bring stuff, what I would call like a Sasquatch goodwill. They seem to have uh, items that you would find at a campsite or in the dump, which I think is apropos to this discussion, that have a bit of a patina on them of mud or moss, wear and tear. Um, they're aged items. They can be broken small to big, right? From muddy cell phones to thermoses to the, everything in between. And these items will be inexplicably laid or set someplace that you just were. And sometimes they're objects of significance based upon what you're thinking about or what you need. Now, you know, this is how you rule out hoaxing really quick is that these items express themselves in people's locked homes. They express themselves at far distances in their locked car. And yet they seem to be attributes of Sasquatch just based upon the nurturing aspect of giving and receiving these gifts in these hot spots. Um, so that's that's been my experience with it. And, you know, Brett and Jill, after I moved from away from this place, had kind of went down and nurtured the activity in one of these hot spots and saw for themselves the give and take of what was happening there. So that's what I always say is don't take our word for any of this stuff. You can go do this on your own if you want to go play Bigfoot. Um, they're just out there waiting. Uh, what about uh, glyphs? I think that's the term. Uh, I, I had a gentleman on from British Columbia several years ago who uh, said that he was communicating with, with Bigfoot and they would take sticks and, and shape them and twist them into different symbols. And it, they were communicating. They didn't really know what these glyphs meant. But um, is that something that you hear from people, uh, contact, Sasquatch contactees? Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the witnesses we talked to in Paranormal Bigfoot calls them glyph Latin or something to that effect, which I wood, think is wood pretty, Latin. Yeah. Wood, Latin wood Latin, which is yeah. exactly what it reminds you of. Now, finding these things out in the forest and saying these are glyphs laying out in the tree and the trails, I have a problem with that just because it's not a controlled environment. But if you can have a controlled area and the same blasted four twigs are making what I can only call like a runic alphabet symbol in different shapes and patterns. And they're moving objects. In this case, we would put objects in these glyphs to see if they would take the objects or move them out or add something. Now we have a story going here. So I think, you know, in our case, we chronicled 24 unique shapes uh, from these same four sticks over and over again that they would make. Now, Nobody knows what they mean. Anybody that says that they know what they mean, run for the hills. I don't think we know what these things mean yet. They haven't told us. Um, but, uh, you know, it does happen. Now, what that, that's just the beginning of what they do with sticks. I mean, we're talking small sticks, living trees they use. We're talking uh, giant limbs. And, you know, I was sent a picture the other day underneath Mount Rainier where someone uh, had witnessed a giant a cedar tree that had been plunged into the earth with the root ball sticking up. Um, I have to tell you about that one later, uh, Brett. But yeah, this is something that, uh, you know, they they love working with wood. <laughs> yeah. A veritable Bob Vila. Um, <laughs> Bigfoot Vila. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mentioned um, Sasquatch contactee, which I'd never heard before. Um, it, I mean, are there other similarities between Sasquatch contactees or are there any similarities, I guess, uh, between Sasquatch contactees and uh, UFO experiencers? Brett? You might have a better one, better answer than I. On that I don't one. think, I mean, in the documentary, we get, really get into it. We're trying to save, especially the ending, um, you know, of this film, we just got back from Phenomicon in Vernal, Utah, home to all sorts of strangeness in the in the basin there in Utah. Um, we had a UFO witness come to Flash of Beauty after I'd met him. You know, we all stayed at the same hotel and all the great Bigfoot and UFO stories start about six in the morning down in the uh, breakfast nook at the Holiday Inn in Vernal. If anybody wants to get, to, uh, you know, uh, the down low on what's going on. And there was a UFO witness that was unfamiliar with my work, unfamiliar with Brett, an incredible background. Um, and I won't get into it, but we invited him to, you know, as a, a UFO witness to come see this Bigfoot film because of the ending of this movie is so similar 
to what this UFO witness, I'm sorry, USO witness USO. underwater. Yeah. yeah, not a UFO, USO. Um, and so, you know, he was moved to tears. Uh, he was absolutely, I remember watching his head go down at the end of this movie, you know, with a crowd of about 75 to 100 people watching it. And then he was just, you know, there was confirmation that he was not alone as a witness and that this happens outside of this world and it comes from all diverse backgrounds. And that's really the joy of what I like to do is I like to be in the company of people to network them to say, hey, you should meet this person. This is how we can get closer to this here. I'm, you know, I'm not always the source here to interview these people or talk to them. I, I, I try to put people together that can help other people to get this done. And then I kind of take the data. Um, so, yeah, it's there's a lot of a lot of distinct and we're just brushing the surface here. I could get into it deep. Yeah, and I just want to add to that real quick too. That that the some of the similarities, if you if you put Bigfoot contactees or Bigfoot experiencers up with alien abductees or people who have had near close encounters of the third kind, um, you have you you have psychological impact, and you know a lot of people talk about psychological impact and, and it's hard to measure. And you know, recent science, medical science, is showing that. that that type of PTSD like trauma will actually leave a, a an impression on the brain. There's actually a physical bruise, if you will, in the brain that you can see uh, with specialized equipment. And you know, some of the individuals that we interview in both films were moved or changed dramatically from a psychological standpoint. And that's very important for us to address because it's not talked about enough. You know, again, like I said earlier, a lot of these people become obsessed with seeing another Bigfoot. They become, um, you know, they have nightmares. They, they become paranoid of the outdoors or the nighttime or, you know, you name it. You know, it affects people in totally different ways. Some people, it, it, you know, they're just fascinated by it and that's, that's it. You know, these people might have thick skin, call it what you want. But some of these other people, um, you know, that, that Doug Meacham talks about in our first film, they go under hypnotherapy and um and recall and recount some of these um encounters so that they can kind of go on and heal you know from from their experiences so it's it, it's a big it's a big deal what about for the two of you i mean i can't imagine um getting into this field and seeing what you've seen and documenting all of this and experiencing what you've experienced and then at the end of you know, this two part or just move on to some other completely different subject matter. I mean, how did, I mean, did you become, have you become obsessed with Bigfoot and how is this going to change maybe the trajectory of your, your professional lives and your personal lives going forward? Um, yes. <laughs> right. To answer your question, right. yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, you know, I, I talked to a friend yesterday who's been a Bigfoot researcher for seven or eight years, and this summer he had his first sighting, and it just amped everything up. I mean, he was he was in it to win it as it was before. I mean, that was not where he hangs up his research tools, I guess, if you will, or his hiking boots, maybe. Um, and I feel the same way. I mean, it's as far as a career trajectory is concerned, I'm a storyteller. Jill's a storyteller. Um, you know, Tobe's a storyteller. He's got a wonderful podcast. Everybody should go back and listen to Strange Brow Radio um, and tells wonderful story. We're all storytellers in that, you know, we want to get out and we want to have these experiences firsthand to tell these stories. And we want to give voices to people that don't have voices. So uh, we'll just see. We'll just see where it goes. I, you know, one day I would love to do a, a narrative feature film about, you know, that, that falls in line with the close encounters of the third kind, you know, the classic Spielberg film, but throw on a Bigfoot instead of a UFO. Mm -hmm. Tope, how about you? Well, yeah, I mean, Brett's favorite film is my favorite film, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. And uh, Roy Neary, you know, says when he's making the mashed potatoes over the dinner plate in his family, shooting them weird looks, this means something. This all means something, folks. Something is about to break. Um, all this disclosure stuff just didn't happen. This is all carefully orchestrated as far as us being 
more in the know about what's going on now are they feeding us a narrative they want to feed us probably but avoid all that something is about to break and bigfoot is a part of i think that whole thing now the native americans would tell you that you know when sasquatch is known to be the world is about ready to end this is one of the things i heard early on from one of the tribes down in northern california um they you know every tribe looks at sasquatch in a different lens but they all pretty much say they are i don't really know of a first nations tribe that says that they're not but they all pretty much say that they are walking between two worlds um so what am i going to do with all this i'm kind of just kind of sitting back and and watching all this stuff kind of coalesce because these dogman stories seem to be just as legit i've interviewed people that have had very compelling experiences with werewolves um and the ufo stuff just is uh, is so fascinating and uh, you know we just had an interview with dr jeff meldrum um and we should all probably send up some prayer for him because i know he had a, a medical issue here recently but uh, we talked to jeff uh about ufos in this podcast and I was shocked to learn that he was following that very closely. I think that's really, I found that deeply fascinating that the scholarly, um, you know, Bigfoot expert is also following this UFO disclosure thing. Cause I think it lays out the ground for groundwork for how we kind of handle things in the Bigfoot world and maybe what we don't do, but I don't think we should change the name to UAPs. Um, you know, <laughs> I still am a big fan of UFOs. <laughs> Likewise, likewise, yeah. a flash of beauty. Again, give us the particulars, the details on how we can screen a flash of beauty, Bigfoot revealed and paranormal Bigfoot. Flash of beauty, Bigfoot revealed is on Amazon, uh, YouTube for rent, Vudu, Google Play, iTunes, um, and Tubi. And paranormal Bigfoot will be released October 17th. The pre-orders are available now. Um, and again, you can follow us on Facebook. Um, just type in Flash of Beauty, Bigfoot Revealed will pop up. And you know, both Jill and I like to read every single message that comes in. And if you've got a story, we'd love to hear it. Gentlemen, thank you both. Fascinating. Thank you, Richard. Appreciate it. Thank you. Hi there. If you want to watch the rest of these episodes, please head over to my Rumble channel, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. You can watch complete episodes there. New complete unedited episodes drop every monday wednesday and friday again the rumble channel is richard Serrett's strange planet in the meantime i want to thank you for supporting this youtube channel all of these years however the problem is i never know when i'm going to run afoul of the censors at youtube i never know when i'm going to end up in youtube jail there doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason and in fact two more strikes and this youtube channel will be taken down altogether so Help me fight big tech censorship, enjoy the complete unedited episodes, and join the rest of the Strange Planet community over on Rumble. Again, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet on Rumble.com. See you over there. Hey there, and welcome to another episode of Strange Planet. Thanks, as always, for sticking me in your ear. And if you'd like to get deeper into Strange Planet, it's real simple. Just click on the link in the episode description, strangeplanet.supportingcast.fm, strangeplanet.supportingcast.fm. And uh, there are three monthly subscriber tiers to choose from. Choose the one that's right for you. You gain access to commercial free listening, although I love my sponsors. You also uh, can um, gain access to bonus episodes, special bonus episodes produced just for premium subscribers. And you get a subscription to my free monthly newsletter, Inner Sanctum, strangeplanet.supportingcast.fm. All right. For those of you on Rumble, that's where we're headed. The persistence of the soul. It's a captivating work. And it delves into 
psychic medium phenomena, spiritual or spirit visitations, afterlife communication, reincarnation, synchronicity, and near-death experiences. And my guest has, through meticulous research and heartfelt introspection, woven together a narrative that underscores the continuity of consciousness beyond the confines of the physical body. This is uh, ultimately really the only topic that matters. What happens after we die? Mark Ireland is the co-founder of Helping Parents Heal, an organization with more than 24,000 members that assists bereaved parents worldwide. He's participated in mediumship research studies uh, conducted by the University of Arizona and University of Virginia, and he currently operates a medium certification program. He is the author of Soul Shift, and uh, again, his latest is The Persistence of the Soul. Medium, Spirit Visitations, and Afterlife Communication. Mark Ireland, welcome to Strange Planet. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me. You actually got your copy before I've even seen the finished printed copy. <laughs> <laughs> How about that? There you go. Well, that's what that's, it looks like, Mark. If you're It looks here. great. <laughs> it does. It looks yeah. great. Uh, so we should begin with the death of your son. Uh, tell us about him. Sure. Um, my youngest son, Brandon, um, he was 18 years old at the time. And on this particular day, I had been out of town for work the prior week, <clears throat> came home, and he had in, uh, indicated he would plan to hike to the top of the McDowell Mountains in Scottsdale, Arizona, where we were living, which was behind our home. And uh, I felt a little uneasy about it. And later on that morning, I felt almost like I got this premonition or something, like something could go wrong. I tried to talk him out of going. He went anyway. And his parting words to me, hey, dad, we're going, you know, like back off. And at that point, it's like, look, maybe I'm just being, we're being a worried dad for no good reason. But we had gone across town uh, to some other event. And later in the day, I got this distress, distress call. We came rushing back. And by the time we got to the base of the mountains, there was a swarm of people, fire trucks, ambulance. Um, later, a helicopter came down, found out. Um, Brandon had um, had basically died on the top of the mountain, didn't know why or what had happened, uh, talked to his best buddy who had tried to revive him, and uh, he had just said that his uh, limbs had, were numb and he was complaining of a rapid heartbeat, uh, but he really didn't know what was wrong, and, um, and that was what had happened, um, and kind of the beginning stages of some of the signs and synchronicities and my plunging back into this this field, uh, which was really my dad's field mm -hmm. of psychic phenomena mediumship, happened after that. And we can get into that at whatever point you'd like. Well, first of all, uh, you know, as a father of uh, twin, soon to be 17 year olds, uh, I am so sorry for your loss. I, I cannot imagine uh, well, thank you, Richard. what you went through. Um, so you mentioned your father the late Dr. Richard Ireland, who was a uh, bit of a renowned psychic medium himself. Just tell us a little bit about your dad. And, you know, he worked with some real luminaries in the entertainment industry. Yeah, he did. Um, you know, he started out, I think, really his abilities were discovered when he was about five years old. He was born in the, near Columbus, Ohio, and he was born cross-eyed. So my grandma, grandparents had taken him into the children's hospital there in Columbus for corrective surgery on his eyes. And after the surgery had been completed, he was laying in a bed and he was actually restrained because they were concerned. His eyes were cupped and bandaged. They didn't want him touching them. And a nurse came by and felt sorry for him and asked, uh, and he, he basically pleaded with her to let him out of the bed. And she said she let him out if he promised not to touch the bandages. So he he agreed to that. She went on her rounds, came back and found him bouncing a ball against the wall and catching it and thinking, oh, my God, he's taken off the bandages. But he hadn't. So that was almost even more disturbing to her. And then she rounded up some physicians to have them observe this. And then they put him in bed and tried some different exercises to see, you know, what was going on. So they'd have one stand at the foot of the bed and another talk from the doorway and ask who is ask him who was standing at the foot of the bed and he always got it correct so you know that was kind of the early sign from my family that there was something different about my dad and then by the time he was 13 he actually uh, did his first I guess you would call a public demonstration 
in a spiritualist circle. He'd stumbled into the spiritualist camp at that young age and uh, observed some, uh, like a medium basically doing what he would later do in life. Uh, and the man had told him some something about a good friend of his that had just died and shared a secret code name that only the two boys knew. So my dad was really fascinated and and intrigued by this. And the man told him he would someday be doing what he's doing. So fast forward, my dad ended up uh, doing the uh, Morse Pratt Institute, uh, which was to become uh, or the ordination process for the Spiritualist National Spiritualist Association of Churches. And then he was like a traveling minister and he would demonstrate his abilities in various church, spiritualist churches around the U.S., and then eventually um, he was, you know, felt like it was still too dogmatic for him. And he wanted a place that would be a church that was really open and let people form their own opinions and, and um, their own belief structure without as much dogma. So he founded something called the University of Life Church in 1960 in Phoenix, Arizona. And then he met a lot of people over the years, one of which was May West in 1952. He was introduced by Jack Kelly, who was a famous uh, spiritualist medium of the day. And then um, he, my dad, eventually after Kelly had passed, um, he reconnected with May and became her personal psychic. And then I don't know if it was through that channel or others, but he ended up, you know, counseling others like uh, David Jan. These are older names, David Jansen, or the Amanda Fugit. Blake. Amanda Blake, who was Miss Kitty on Gunsmoke. Oh, yes. I met I met her. I met Mae West actually when I was 19. It was pretty cool. I got to go into her apartment and go on a tour. Uh, so my dad's abilities were really unique. I've not seen anybody like him since his passing. I think the closest I've seen is Gordon Smith, who's a psychic medium out of Scotland. But my dad could get first and last names, very specific information about people who had passed. But mainly he was uh, he was prominent during the 60s and 70s and into the 80s. And back then, you know, you really didn't talk about medium stuff very much. It was more psychic phenomena and dealing with parapsychology and he's seeking credibility through, you know, the work that was done by people like Dr. J.B. Ryan at Duke University Parapsychology Lab and that sort of thing. So he would do psychic demonstrations and things like that. There's one actually, if people want to see it, they can go to my website. There's a link at the bottom of the front of the uh, front page, just says uh, see Richard Ireland in action. But that's uh, an appearance he made on the Steve Allen show in 1971 that was pretty impressive. And it's representative of what he would do. So I grew up with this stuff. And even from a young age, I, I just tell you that when my son passed, it helped me so much to have seen the evidence that I'd seen, not just the psychic stuff, but where my dad would spontaneously start delivering very specific messages to people pertain, pertaining to people who had passed that were their loved ones. So it gave me a real confidence beyond just like like a religious belief that where you're required to completely have blind faith. But I actually had more what I would felt was proof or evidence like, hey, there is something more than what we see here living in this physical domain. So that's a little bit about my dad and where I was coming from at the time my son passed and how it helped me kind of bridge that a little better than probably the average person. That's a remarkable, remarkable story. Were there other uh, people in your family? Because sometimes this is generational. Other uh, members of your family who were psychic. Yeah, it's it's interesting you say that too. Because uh, Dr. Julie Beichel of Winbridge, she uh, has stated, and I've already known this, that you know it is it does follow family lines. So my great my great grandmother apparently had this. My grandmother ended up having it as well and then my uncle who was my dad's younger brother had it in fact it was just days after my son brandon's passing that i spoke with my uncle um actually i spoke to him the day of the passing but we didn't know the cause of death he called me several days later or i called him i can't remember which it was when i was in the mortuary making arrangements and he told me he said hey mark i've gotten something to share with you um, he says, you know, last night I tried to make a connection um, through meditation, but I couldn't get anything. But this morning I got up doing my morning meditation and your dad came to me and he wanted you to know that he was there when Brandon passed. And he, he, he said, Brandon was a little confused what was going on, but he helped him adjust, helped him cross over. 
Brandon wanted you to know that you're the best parents he ever could have had. And that's the thing we like to hear. But what he gave me along with that was the evidence. And that's what I'm all about. Mm. Uh, he said, you know, Brandon's death was caused by a lack of oxygen in his bloodstream that eventually caused his heart to fail. Um, it was a couple of days after that that I spoke to the physician who conducted the autopsy. She told me my son had died from a severe asthma attack that drove his blood oxygen levels down, causing cardiac arrest. So my uncle actually told me two days or three days before the autopsy result. So that was really the first thing bringing me back into my dad's world and his realm and his field. And it, something that I shared with everyone we knew that was of great comfort. So with your son's uh, passing, um, did this sort of push you into further investigation of afterlife communication and, and um, more of what your father was doing? Absolutely. Um, it's interesting because I was always proud of my dad and I appreciated his work and I bring friends to see him and things like that. But I went down a different path in life. How many of us really want to be our parent, right? So I went into the, I got a college degree. I got married young, went into the business world and was doing well. But this kind of shook me up and said, hey, it's time to reassess where you're headed in life. And I, I haven't gotten out of the business world, but my focus is different now. And I'm not so absorbed into that and so focused on just worldly achievement, I would say. Um, so that brought me really out of, you know, um, intrigue and interest. I remembered everything I'd seen growing up and my dad's abilities, but I wanted to see, you know, who does this today? <clears throat> what are they like? You know, how does it work for them? And can I make connection, you know? And, and, and I would say one of the earliest things that happened, which was really interesting, I was watching, um, an excerpt on the local Phoenix area NBC affiliate, and they were showing um, about a study that was going on at the University of Arizona at the time, where they were um, testing mediums under blinded conditions where they couldn't see the sitter. The sitter is the person who's seeking messages. Is that uh, Gary Schwartz? Gary Schwartz. Yeah, it, it was Gary at the time, and and um, and actually um, Julie Beichel started out as an assistant in the lab, but she founded Winbridge years later, and she does her own thing. And her work is meticulous. So I was watching this thing about Gary and his work. And at the time, they showed a clip with Alison Dubois. Now, most people would know her name from the show Medium, which was a Hollywood production. The early episodes actually were based on true accounts that she was involved with. But um, it was the real Alison Dubois that the story is about that was um, that was on this clip. And the information she was sharing with this couple that she couldn't see or communicate with was later validated by the couple. It was really specific stuff. And I thought, wow, she's really good. I'd really enjoy having a, a session with her. And I'd love to be in that lab. Well, little did I know both of those things were going to transpire. The very next day, I get a call out of the blue from a man in Dallas, Texas named Jerry Conser, who had been in friends with my father. And he said, hey, Mark, I know what you've been through and I know someone who may be able to help you. Her name's Allison Dubois. And here's a phone number you can call to make an appointment. So I thought that was a rather synchronistic kind of event. And then um, about six months later, I, I was working on my first book and um, an agent that I had, or it was actually a, a writer, uh, an editor that was working with me. She reached out to the lab to see if I could get in there. And lo and behold, by February of 2005, I did get in there for an experiment as a test sitter that was filmed for a Discovery Channel uh, feature. Um, and people could see that on my website as well. We can talk about that later. But uh, yeah, that's kind of where it went. And that's, uh, you know, I do have a family full of these folks and I've had my own experiences as well. Well, let, let's talk about um, prior to, let's say, going to a, a medium. Um, any contact with your with your son, Brandon? Well, there's a couple of things that happened that were pretty remarkable. So that's where I feel like we're my... Um, not just belief, but knowledge of the truth of this. Go. It's not just because I relied on it. one medium reading or this. It was a multi-layered kind of thing where we had a number of different things happen. I'd say the very first thing was I really wanted my own kind of personal connection. So within a, it was within a day or two of his passing, I decided to go in. I went into a, a large closet, shut the door where it was pitch black, sat down and tried to meditate. And I'm not a great meditator, but in this case, I just kind of prayed for a connection. 
And um, while sitting there, in if in my mind's eye, I'm looking at the back of my forehead as a screen, which is how my dad described his ability. I saw an image of my son go by smiling like he was joyful and happy. But right after that was a cross with an oval loop at the top. And I'd seen those, but I really didn't know what they were. So it made me then go to Google after this experience and look up what that was. And I found that it's called an Ankh and it's the oldest cross of human history. The lower portion representing physical life and the oval loop at the top representing eternal life. So what I got was my son in a joyful state followed by a symbol I had to decipher, which for me being somewhat skeptical and wanting to, you know, <laughs> analytical, look up and find out what it meant that it confirmed, hey, dad, I'm okay, you know, I'm in eternal life. So that was one, that was really probably the first thing that happened. So that was a, a nice starting point. Uh, six months after, and and actually I, I did speak to an intuitive two weeks after who told me that within six months I would see him at the side of our bed. So six months later, um, my wife and I go on a cruise with our older son, Stephen, and Brandon's best friend. Brandon was going to go on this for his high school graduation, but since he wasn't physically able to, we took his buddy and our older son. So set, after seven days, we get back. Uh, we we get into the house. My wife is sitting at the bed. So this prediction turns out to be true, but not exactly uh, the way it was described because it, my wife had the experience, not me. She's sitting at the foot of our bed and she feels our son Brandon's presence and sees him as a shadow figure out of her peripheral vision. Now, confirming this is kind of interesting because the very next day we get a call from a man named James Linton. James was a musician who had borrowed Brandon's bass guitar. Brandon was a bassist. And he was recording in his home studio some new material and wanted to borrow the bass. And we had actually initially met James because he'd been on the mountain the day of Brandon's passing and his group got there and tried to help, but was too late. So James, from that point, he connected with us through an online obituary, basically leaving a message. Hey, reach out to me if you want to know more, which we did. And then we became friends. So here it is the day after Susie's experience where she sees her son as a shadow figure. James calls the next morning and says, hey, Susie, I've got something to tell you, but I don't know how to tell you. And she thinks he's going to say he broke the base or something. But wow. he says, he says, um, well, I was in my rec studio recording and I felt like there was another presence in the room with me. And I, as I was playing this, I saw a shadow figure out of my peripheral vision. I also fla saw flashes of white light. I thought I was hallucinating. So I went and got water. Then I took a shower. I got something to eat. But each time I came back, it got stronger and stronger. And he said, finally, I said, OK, Brandon, what do you want? And at that point, he somehow felt guided to reshape the song he was working on redo the lyrics and change the bass line. And he he's left-handed. Brandon was right-handed, so he's playing his bass upside down. But he uh, ended up composing a song called The Other Side or, or On the Other Side. And he, he said, this is the best song I've ever written, but I didn't write it. Um, so those are two events that were outside of the mediumship readings that happened within the first six months, which were very remarkable and very comforting. Very remarkable. Uh... Absolutely incredible. The persistence of the soul. Mark Ireland is here. We'll take a quick time. I'll come back and uh, discuss further. Hi there. If you want to watch the rest of these episodes, please head over to my Rumble channel, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. You can watch complete episodes there. New, complete, unedited episodes drop every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Again, the Rumble channel is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. In the meantime, I want to thank you for supporting this YouTube channel all of these years. However, the problem is I never know when I'm going to run afoul of the censors at YouTube. I never know when I'm going to end up in YouTube jail. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason. And in fact, two more strikes and this YouTube channel will be taken down altogether. So, Help me fight big tech censorship, enjoy the complete unedited episodes, and join the rest of the Strange Planet community over on Rumble. Again, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet on Rumble.com. See you over there.
Mark Ireland is here. The resist the persistence of the soul medium, spirit visitations, and afterlife communication. Um at this point, I mean, where are you in your 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 grieving process? It's just been what, six, six months? Well, no, well, you know, what I'm describing to you is what happened back then, but I'm I'm dec I'm more than a decade into it now. Right. But at the time, uh, yeah, at the time, yeah. when, um, it was about six months, I guess. Correct. Yeah. What I'm describing to you is six months into it. And uh, I hadn't had my first mediumship reading at that point yet, because I thought Alison Dubois was going to happen faster than it did. That did occur later in the fall. It was remarkable. And I had one the same year with Linda Williamson, who was a prominent medium out of England. She's since retired, but both of those were really um, earth shattering for me <laughs> and, and kind of led me on, on the path. But um, yeah, it brought me back into my dad's field, looking at this through a, a variety of different lenses with an analytical mind, but an open mind. And, um, and yeah, it was about, like you said, at the six month point that, that experience had happened with my wife. And and again, at that point, where were you in, in your grieving process? I would say we were way ahead of the average parent who has had a child pass. Um, I think it's a combination of things. One thing, and, and you'd mentioned at the beginning that I co-founded this organization called Helping Parents Heal, which has blossomed into this massive thing with 100 affiliate locations or chapters around the world now and 25,000 members. We had our first ever conference um, in Phoenix a year and a, uh, a year ago. We're going to have another one in 2024 with 900 attendees. We sold out. Um, but I, through this, I've observed what helped me heal and what has helped a lot, of, a lot of other folks heal. It's a combination of, you know, support from loved ones, uh, meeting with people who have been through the same thing and, su and support from them and where you can ex have an open exchange of, of your situation, your experiences. Um, it's it's service too. It's learning to you know serve others in a positive way because it kind of comes back to help you. It's letting go of, I guess I would say, uh, self blame or feelings of hate or unforgiveness towards others that you maybe assign blame to. But the last piece, which is really the big piece, I think, is the hope piece, and that's where all this stuff comes in because it provides you with hope. Um, that goes beyond what the world wants you to believe, you know, just in the secular, humanistic, atheistic kind of lens, or even the fundamentalist religious traditions that ask you to believe in things that don't really make a lot of sense to everybody. Uh, but rather, you know, I took a path of personal experience to confirm my own um, knowledge and, and belief system. But we were way ahead of that because of these factors. So tell me about then your your first um, successful, let's say, meeting with a, with a medium. Yeah, ironically, they were actually all successful, even though I was pretty guarded going in and trying to make sure they didn't know anything about me or at least a minimal amount. Uh, the first one was actually, as I recall, Alison Dubois. I'd say one of the most remarkable things about that was two weeks before I went into that reading, Someone who knew my father handed me a typewritten manuscript. It was a box full of eight and a half by 11 inch pages typewritten. It was called Your Psychic Potential, A Guide to Psychic Development by Dr. Richard Ireland, dated 1973. I'm like, well, where'd you get this? And he, and he said, well, your dad, before his passing, asked me to keep this safe for him because um, you were out of state at the time. I said, well, that was 12 years ago. Why are you giving this to me today? Because I never even heard of this. And he says, I don't know. I just feel like I'm supposed to. I said, okay. So two, fast forward two weeks, I go to meet Allison Dubois. One of the first things she says to me is, well, I have your father here and he showed me a book, but I, I think it's his book, but it's for you to take forward. Does that make sense to you? And I'm like, yep, I, I get it. <laughs> um, you know, and I end up, getting that book published in 2011, which was pretty cool. Um, mm. And um, But in addition to that, she did give me a number of um, affirmations about my son and things. Like she had described that she felt like uh, his chest was uh, filled with water or like it was like a drowning. Um, and actually the autopsy physician had said that um, cases like my son's, it, 
when you have that oxygen deprivation, the lungs expand trying to capture more oxygen, almost touching in the middle. And that only happens in drownings or severe asthma cases. So the sensation she got was exactly correct. She also got uh, a number of other things pertaining to my um, my family, um, my, my wife's name, my uh, sister-in-law's name, um, and some other things that, that were helpful. So that was, um, and that's going back quite a way. So I'm, I'm just trying to call the memory of everything, but it was, it was really phenomenal as a first experience. And I was very guarded. I probably could have had an even better session if I'd have been a little more open. Um, but I was, I was guarded because I wanted to make sure it was completely legit and there was no cold reading involved or anything like that. And I ended up using content from that reading as a chapter in my first book, Soul Shift. So um, it, it was really a, a remarkable first experience. And that kind of spurred me to, to find other people and to meet some of the people that do the research too and get more in, involved. So that was one of the early steps in my journey. Um, at what point, uh, if at all, did you get sort of a clear communication uh, through a medium uh, from from Brandon? I'd say it's, you know, what I found with my dad was really the best communicator. And I think that's because he used to do it in life. So maybe when you're on the other side, it, whatever those laws of physics or whatever are, um, he probably understands that better. But I, I got I got good communication from Brandon. It was more bits and pieces, I'd say, early on. Whereas with my dad, I was getting like whole big picture kind of stuff. Um, but I, I did get good affirmations along the way. One, um, I'll just jump ahead here a little bit, like a uh, medium I let, met later, Jamie Clark, he had brought up a, a photograph. He has, you know, he described my son's passing. And in fact, a number of the, I think three or four, the first four all described the circumstances of it passing, kind of the, the surroundings. Jamie had talked about this desert area and him laying on his back and all this kind of stuff. And then he says, uh, your son is showing me a photo and it's of him and his brother arm in arm and they're like at the top of a pass and it's real green. It looks like Hawaii. And I didn't recall that, but shortly thereafter, I went into a drawer and was pulling out old photos from a trip to Hawaii. And lo and behold, I find this photo of the two of them arm in arm uh, at a pass in Hawaii, which actually that's even better than getting something that I already knew or was top of mm -hmm. mind because someone could allege telepathy with me. So it clearly wasn't a case of that. It was giving me something that I kind of had to dig up, almost like going back to the onk thing I mentioned earlier, where, mm -hmm. okay, here's, here's a little project for you, dad, go find this. Um, and then, you know, the one, when I finally got into the lab at U of A for the, um, the reading, it was with a medium named Lori Campbell, who's outstanding. She's top tier, but it was blind. She didn't know who I was. She didn't know who she was reading for. She was just given a few basics, like, um, you know, the sitters. Well, she wasn't even in my name. She just was asked questions about certain deceased people. And so the first one she was asked about was someone named Brandon. And then she had brought forth like, well, I feel like the person behind me, um, is maybe writing about him. And I was, I was writing the, the book Soul Shift and it was largely about Brand, his life and all these experiences. And she says, well, I feel like she was asked for his cause of death. And she so said, my chest area, I feel like my chest, like um, it's, it's, I can't breathe. Uh, and I feel like I want to throw up. Well, Brandon's buddy, uh, who had tried to resuscitate him said that just before Brandon passed out, he did throw up, he vomited. Um, and she, uh, she said that the, his school had done something for him like a tree with a plaque. Well, he went to Sorrel high school in Scottsdale, Arizona. Um, a young man who, I don't know if he's a friend or just being kind, but he sculpted a metal bass guitar and it was put there with a plaque with Brandon's name and a, a pink Floyd verse on it and then a tree was planted behind that so these are things she couldn't have known obviously uh so there was you know a lot of good detail and, and information that was shared in those early sessions and then you know even after soul shift was written i had other experiences i think the one that was most touching of all is actually documented in persistence of the soul it was with a medium named tina powers who's based in tucson 
share, please, if you can. Yeah, that one, um, there was just so much there, even early on. I was brought to that reading by a friend that lived in Tucson, and she was like begging me to go meet this Tina Powers. <laughs> and she said that, um, you know, you got to meet her. She's phenomenal. And and so she says, I've set up this, this reading for myself. Will you please come? And I had a two-hour drive. I said, all right. So I just went down to give her moral support. So we sit down with Tina. Tina looks surprised, like, who's this guy? What's he doing here? This is your reading. So um, she introduces me by first name. We sit down and Tina starts to go in for her. And she says, I'm sorry, but I have to turn my attention to him. I feel like this reading's for him. And so the whole thing happened for me at that point. Um, and she went on, she says, um, well, the first thing I'm feeling, I'm being taken across the ocean and I feel like I'm in Ireland. And I said, well, I think that's a clue because that's my last name. <laughs> <laughs> so um, she went on about, uh, a number of things. Um, but I think the most touching thing was I was, I don't want to hurt anyone's feeling. There's someone I was working with at the time on a project and um, Tina had named what this person's occupation was and said that um, because we had had kind of a, a rift over this whole situation with this woman and Tina basically took on my son's persona and said, uh, she didn't get it. She didn't get it, dad exactly as my son would have said it so it's almost like it was channeling him directly after giving me the specifics about the person their role what they did for a living and all this kind of stuff um that was really touching she also talked about you know uh research that had been done on my dad because i was trying to dig up because he had often talked about being tested in various labs uh looking up information that um I was trying to find this and that she said that I would find, and I did turn up some of these, these things, including um, one of the most remarkable one was actually a uh, newspaper article from 1972 from the Tuscaloosa, Alabama times. I think it was called the Tuscaloosa times or news. Um, and a man named Helmut Schmidt, who was the number two man who worked for the Duke uh, parapsychology lab back in the day, under J.B. Ryan, he was the director. He had gone, um, and he had made mention in this article about, how, you know, that he felt like the, the lab could have gotten even better results if they'd used professional psychics, where J.B. Ryan was always hesitant to do that. He was afraid of someone would try and trick him or whatever, mm -hmm. but um, they held the control, so really there shouldn't have been any chance of that happening anyhow. But Helmut Schmidt had made mention of going to see this psychic, Dr. Richard Ireland, and he said that um, he he was there and he decided to do his own test on my father. So it's kind of for Duke, but an unofficial one for Duke. Um, he had gone to like three different tables of people. And he said, uh, give me a number, one to 10. So he wrote a number for each table. One was three, the next gave him eight, the next gave him five. So he took the number 385, wrote it in red ink, put it in a sealed envelope. Meantime, my father, as part of his demonstration, would cover his eyes with 10 strips, 10 strips of Johnson Johnson medical tape, which if you've ever used it, it's extremely sticky. It'll pull any hair off when it when it's removed. So it seals tight against over his eyes, down. He'd even cover his nose in case people would allege that he could look through his nostrils or something crazy like that. <laughs> Three opaque black blindfolds and then more tape down covering his cheek here. So there's no way. He could even if somebody would allege, oh, you could somehow still see through the blindfolds. It was taped below that, covering that bottom. So Schmidt, he takes this envelope and sends it up to to the uh, lectern where my dad was, and um, and it along with these other messages, which are called billets that he would give people messages to. Um, and um, my dad grabbed the envelope without opening it and said, "Oh, you want to know what's in this? It's the number three eight five, written in red ink." And so Schmidt's just blown away. And he's like, well, you know, the odds against this are millions to one. So that was his argument that they should have brought some professional psychics in for the research. But, you know, my dad, during those demonstrations, he would get papers from a variety of people with different questions, but he would go way off what was written on the paper, give them a lot more information, naming occupations, marital situations, children, pending birth dates, he'd predict births of children that were accurate and all kinds of crazy stuff like that. Um, and then occasionally, but not usually at these kind of uh, demonstrations, he would 
do a little mediumship if it just came to him, if it was like somebody touched in. Um, so anyhow, I kind of dragged that out a bit, but um, that's that's that. <laughs> <laughs> that is that indeed. The persistence of the soul. Um, Mark, we'll take another time out, come back and uh, talk a, a little bit about the uh, medium certification program. Back with more of our conversation right after these. Hi there. If you want to watch the rest of these episodes, please head over to my Rumble channel, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. You can watch complete episodes there. New, complete, unedited episodes drop every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Again, the Rumble channel is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. In the meantime, I want to thank you for supporting this YouTube channel all of these years. However, the problem is I never know when I'm going to run afoul of the censors at YouTube. I never know when I'm going to end up in YouTube jail. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason. And in fact, two more strikes and this YouTube channel will be taken down altogether. So help me fight big tech censorship. Enjoy the complete unedited episodes and join the rest of the Strange Planet community over on Rumble. Again, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet on Rumble.com. See you over there. And we're here with Mark Ireland. The new book is The Persistence of the Soul, Mediums, Spirit Visitations, and Afterlife Communication. Um, it sounds like you have had tremendous success uh, with, with mediums. And it doesn't need to be stated, uh, but it, I mean, it's obvious there are so many charlatans out there. Um, so... Tell me about this medium certification pro certification program. Is that to, to sort of, I don't know, weed out the charlatans or what is it? What is it all about? Yeah, you're pretty much on target. It's what I actually think there's a lot more deluded people than there are charlatans. There are charlatans and I've come upon a couple of them. Um, but I think there's a lot more people that think that they have this and they either don't or they have very little of it. I think we all have some psychic capacity. It's just a question of how much. So really what it comes down to is find the people that are most gifted. And like you said, I think it runs in family lines. I think the people that are best at it are born with it and aren't just trying to become one later through exercises and workshops and things like that. And the people that are the very best, like my dad, you know, they're born with it. Plus they work on development as well and to refine it over time. But this all kind of started when I launched or when my first book, Soul Shift, came out. Um, I had a lot of folks coming to me. And then later with the Helping Parents Heal organization, when it first got off the ground, they wanted to have an experience with a medium. Um, so either people had said they went to somebody that wasn't that good. So they got a little bit, but they weren't convinced or they hadn't been yet. And they wanted to know how to find a good medium. And initially I was just steering them to the good people that I knew. But a lot of them, like Alison Dubois, I mean, they're celebrities now um, and they have huge wait lists. Like people like Suzanne Giesman, I know, and um, I, you know, there's a number of them. But the thing is that like some of these folks not only would have two year wait lists, but they were expensive because that was their full time op occupation and they were celebrities. And that was kind of a way really of of limiting how many people would book as well. So initially I was steering people to some of those, but a lot of folks just couldn't afford that or they didn't want to wait a year or two to get a reading. So I thought, you know what, there have to be other people out there that are undiscovered that have this ability that are really good. So what I did then, I reached out to a couple of friends in the field of research. I had, like, as you mentioned earlier, I had been through um, and been participated, participated in a study that was done by Dr. Emily Williams Kelly of the Univers University of Virginia Division of Perceptual Studies. And I learned a little bit about the protocols she used in her experiment. And then I went over to my friend, Tricia Robertson, who's with the S uh, Scottish Society of Psychical Research. She's done some outstanding research herself. So I bounced ideas and I developed protocols based on the feedback I got. And then I've refined them because this has been going on. I've been doing this for nine years now. 
and have certified about 40 people. Um, and what I do now is really they each medium that applies, they have to go through five blinded readings via Zoom with no video. Um, and they're just given a first name of the sitter. The sitter's been instructed in terms of what they can, how they can respond. It's got to be you know, yes, no, but not really elaborating at length, things like that. And so what, what happens is this reading will start. The medium shares anything they get initially. And then um, then the sitter is allowed to ask for contact, maybe with a person sharing only a first name. And then the medium continues on. And all this is recorded. Uh, the audio recording takes place. And then when it's concluded, uh, then the sitter can ask a few questions or whatever. Um, but, you know, after once their identity has been revealed or they've turned the video on, then the you know the the part that's used for the certification is no longer applied. We then take the recording; it's transcribed, and then the sitter's responsibility is to go through it and really grade the accuracy of the statements. Um, and, and they're grading either correct, incorrect, indeterminable, like maybe they may get a prediction about something that hasn't happened yet, um, or they can assign a bonus either a two point or a five point bonus, depending on what it is. So for example, let's say the medium says, okay, your son's name starts with an A and the name is Alan. Okay, maybe you give a two point bonus for that. Right. But if they say, hey, your son's name was Alan, then it's a five point bonus. And then if they say, hey, Alan's favorite food was pizza, maybe you give two points, but it's his favorite food was pizza with anchovies, pepperoni and olives. Mm -hmm. That's five point bonus, okay? So that kind of gives you a flavor of it, but it's basically then statistically graded. And I've set the barometer a minimum passing score of 75. So that could either mean 75% accurate, or it could mean um, a minimum 65% accurate plus bonus points that get them over 75. Um, and what we do is we set aside the indeterminable statements, unless there's an inordinate amount of those. They can have no more than one third of the statements be indeterminable, because then it's like, OK, look, if half the things you say are indeterminable, it's not really a good reading. Right. Um, but but at the same time, you're going to get stuff that maybe we can't verify because the, the parent, maybe or whoever the sitter is. Um, doesn't know the answer because it, the answer pertains to somebody who lives in Europe or something like that, or it's a future prediction. So that's the methodology, but I will say, you know, I've I've probably had half a dozen people score in the 90s to 100 range using that that methodology. So I've got some really good people. Uh, conversely, I've had some people that just eat by, and I've increased the standard or upped it two times um, over the years just to make it harder because I really want to get the very best people on there uh, because you know I'm doing this as out of my. The, I'm doing it as a, as a public service. I don't make anything. I don't charge anything. I have, you know, if the mediums charge money, that's between them and the sitter. I don't have any financial uh, tie to this. I've invested all my own money to develop the protocol, the uh, website, maintain the website. So I put thousands of dollars into this and it's a public service. And so where can we see this list of these are the grade A um, psychic mediums? Where, where can we find them? So all of them who've passed, I don't designate, hey, here's the ones who scored the highest, medium, or low, but the the, the uh, people who have ratings from them can go on and grade them and put ratings in. Um, my website is markirelandauthor.com, and there's a link there to the, the certified medium site. So rather than confuse people, if they just go to my website, they'll find links to not only um, the certified medium site, but they'll find a link to... Um, the, the videos for my dad, if they want to see him in action and then other, um, they could see the discovery channel clip there as well. Persistence of the soul mediums, spirit visitations and afterlife communication. Mark, how do we get a copy? Well, it comes out on October 3rd. So um, it's going to be on Amazon. My publisher is inner traditions. So you go to the inner traditions website, Barnes and Noble will have it. Um, so, you know, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, uh, they probably sell 80%, 90% of all the books, especially Amazon these days, um, mm -hmm. or inner traditions, you can buy direct from my publisher. And then I'm sure there'll be a lot of small bookstores that will have it. Um, but uh, if you go to my website, I've got links to all the retailers. All right, Mark, what a delight. What an, an amazing story. Thank you so much for this.
I really appreciate the opportunity to share with you and, and thanks for being a great host. Richard Serrett's A Strange Planet drops every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Hi there. If you want to watch the rest of these episodes, please head over to my Rumble channel, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. You can watch complete episodes there. New, complete, unedited episodes drop every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Again, the Rumble channel is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. In the meantime, I want to thank you for supporting this YouTube channel all of these years. However, the problem is I never know when I'm going to run afoul of the censors at YouTube. I never know when I'm going to end up in YouTube jail. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason. And in fact, two more strikes and this YouTube channel will be taken down altogether. So help me fight big tech censorship. Enjoy the complete unedited episodes and join the rest of the Strange Planet community over on Rumble. Again, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet on Rumble.com. See you over there.